tonight. Hasina investigation. Bangladesh Crimes Tribunal issues arrest warrant for exiled former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Mastermind elimination. Israel confirms Hamas leader Sinwar killed during a routine in Gaza petrol. A chief architect of the October 7th attack on Israel that sparked the war. Nabu Ubeis. EU leaders open the door for outsourcing migration as they call for new ways to curb arrivals. And celebrating pop. The largest pop culture event on the East Coast, New York Comic Con, kicks off at Javits Center in Manhattan. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we have some lots of updates that occurred around the globe and we start today's bulletin in neighboring Bangladesh. Bangladesh courts ordered an arrest warrant for former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, who fled to India in August after she was ousted by mass protest. 77-year-old Hasina, who controlled the country for more than 20 years, was ousted by mass protests in August and fled to India. The ICT's chief prosecutor said Hasina was in control of those who committed massacres, killings and crimes against humanity in July to August and ordered the arrest of Hasina to appear in court in November. The protests began as a student-led movement against government job quotas but a deadly escalation left over a thousand people dead, according to Bangladesh's Interim Health Ministry. Moving to India now, police in financial capital Mumbai arrested a minor for allegedly posting online bomb threats to three flights earlier this week. Indian airlines have this month received a spate of threats to domestic and international flights on their social media, all of which have been false alarms. Ram Mohan Naidu, the country's a civil aviation minister ruled out conspiracy theories but said action was being taken. He said the incidents were very minor and isolated incidents. In a written statement, Mohan Naidu confirmed that the person arrested was a minor but didn't name him. Local media have reported that bomb threats were made from an account on Twitter and alleged two Indigo flights, one to Muscat and another to Jeddah, and an Air India one to New York had armed militants with explosives. At least eight flights of leading carrier Indigo were subject to threats. Three spice jet ones, two Vistara and four Air India ones have also received similar messages online this week. Air India said its flight from New Delhi to Chicago was forced to land in Canada after a security threat posted online. Passengers were later taken to their destination by a Canadian Air Force plane. Meanwhile, China's President Xi Jinping will travel to Russia next week to attend the BRICS summit in Kazan. She will attend the summit of the emerging economic bloc at the invitation of Russian President Vladimir Putin. During his visit, Xi will attend the leaders' meeting and the expert leaders' dialogues and other activities and have in-depth exchanges with leaders on the current international situation. Mao Ning, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson, said that China is ready to work with all parties to promote BRICS cooperation to usher in a new era of unity and self-reliance in the global south and jointly promote world peace and development. BRICS, originally comprising Brazil, Russia, India and China, has expanded to include South Africa, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran and the UAE. The BRICS summit, strengthening multilateralism for just global development and security, will provide an important platform for leaders to discuss key global issues, additionally offering a valuable opportunity to assess the progress of initiatives launched by BRICS and to identify potential areas for future collaboration. In Somalia's capital Mogadishu, a suicide bomber detonated an unidentified device at a cafe outside a police training school. According to Somalia state media, at least seven people were killed and six others were injured. Somali police said that the bomber, allegedly disguised as a soldier, entered the establishment located outside the General Kahiye Police Academy and detonated a bomb when questioned by people suspicious of his identity. The seven killed on Thursday included police officers, soldiers and civilians. Later the same day, Al-Qaeda-linked militant group Al-Shabaab published a statement online claiming responsibility for the attack. 
Al-Shabaab has previously claimed responsibility for multiple terror attacks in Somalia, including the attack on a public beach that killed 37 people in August. Let's go for a short commercial break now. Mobile news coming right after this. On the road to the White House tonight, Kamala Harris is the first presidential candidate to skip the A.L. Smith dinner in New York in 40 years, breaking with presidential tradition so that she can campaign instead in a battleground state. The dinner benefiting Catholic charities traditionally has been used to promote collegiality and good humor, with presidential candidates from both parties appearing on the same night and trading barbs. It's a night when New York's movers and shakers come under one roof for what's supposed to be a good-natured political laugh, the Al Smith dinner. Power brokers, politicos, past and present, sports stars, team owners and commissioners. A charity dinner at its most popular in a presidential election year led by Cardinal Dolan. The keynote speaker, former President Trump, couldn't resist poking fun at the candidate not in the room, Vice President Harris, who decided to campaign instead of attending the dinner. Trump reached out to Mayor Adams, who was on the dais, acknowledging his own indictments and offering the mayor support. Harris sent a pre-taped message for the dinner with help from a character from Saturday Night Live. Diverting to the Middle East tensions, now Israel confirms that Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, a mastermind of the October 7th attack in 2023 that triggered the Gaza war, has been killed by its forces in the Palestinian enclave. Following the assassination, there is a growing hope of a ceasefire in the Gaza, with US officials insisting on actions for peace. Tonight, this Israeli military drone capturing the final moments of Israel's most wanted terrorist, the mastermind of the October 7th terror attack, Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. This graphic image showing his dead body after he was killed by Israeli forces. It was IDF reservists, not special ops, who came across Sinwar by chance during a routine operation in Rafa yesterday. Flying that drone into a building after a gun battle, spotting an armed man sitting in a chair, his face covered, his hand bleeding after being shot. The man throwing an object at the drone, soldiers soon after killing him. But at this point, they still didn't know it was Sinwar. In fact, it wasn't until today when a separate unit checking the building found his body and recognized it was the Hamas leader, confirming his identity through DNA, dental records and fingerprints. Israel. Tonight, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu saying Sinwar's death brings the end of the war closer. But it's not over yet. President Biden today speaking with Netanyahu from Air Force One, congratulating him on Sinwar's assassination. The two leaders agreeing this is an opportunity to secure the release of the hostages, vowing to work together. U.S. officials telling us Sinwar was the main roadblock in the latest ceasefire and hostage negotiation. Killing Sinwar has been one of the main goals of Israel's war with Hamas. Sinwar in hiding for more than a year and seen here in a Gaza tunnel in video released by the IDF in February. Today, the IDF posting three words, eliminated Yahya Sinwar. Vice President Harris today saying justice has been served and saying this about his killing. The United States, Israel and the entire world are better off as a result. And tonight, Sinwar's assassination dealing a major blow to Hamas amid the threat of wider escalation in this region. Meanwhile, China also joined the global push for peace in Gaza, stressing the urgent need for a ceasefire after Israel said it had killed the Hamas mastermind Yahya Sinwar. Ma Ning, a ministry spokesperson, said at a regular news conference that China believes that the top priority is to fully and effectively implement the relevant UN Security Council resolutions, immediately achieve a ceasefire in Gaza, effectively protect civilians, ensure humanitarian assistance and avoid further escalation of conflicts and confrontations. Sinwar, a mastermind of the October 7th attack that triggered the Gaza war, was killed during an operation by Israeli soldiers in the Palestinian enclave, a pivotal event in the year-long conflict. He was killed during a gun battle in southern Gaza by Israeli troops who were initially unaware that they had caught their country's number one enemy. 
Ning said China will continue to collaborate with the international community to play a constructive role in efforts to de-escalate tensions. Floating a UN Security Council resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire, Israel has continued its brutal offensive on Gaza since an attack last October by Palestinian resistant group Hamas. In an effort to stop reckless attacks and to protect the Red Sea, which is one of the most critical waterways in the world, the US President Joe Biden authorized strikes on Houthi weapon storage locations in parts of Yemen that Iran-backed rebel group controls. The Houthis are backed by Iran and have taken credit for attacking ships in the Red Sea for the past year in response to the war in Gaza. It comes as Israel pushes deeper into South Lebanon. 1.2 million people have now been displaced, the IDF unleashing huge airstrikes. A local mayor and 15 others were killed here, where the UN says they were planning humanitarian responses. Israel says they targeted Hezbollah. And here, a massive IDF detonation obliterates an entire Lebanese village. And another alleged Israeli attack on a UN peacekeeping station. The UN says an IDF tank appeared to fire deliberately on their post. The IDF says the incident is under review. Meantime, Prime Minister Netanyahu has approved a series of targets for retaliatory strikes against Iran. Netanyahu's government has given the White House a general sense of those targets. It's understood the Biden administration is, quote, relatively satisfied. The timing of the strike remains unknown. Iranian Foreign Minister Abbas Arachi held talks with his Egyptian counterpart Badar al and Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi focusing on efforts to de-escalate Israel's conflicts against Gaza and Lebanon. Iran and Egypt have held talks in Cairo to discuss soaring tensions in the Middle East. Fears of a wider regional conflict have grown as Israel plans its response to Iran's attack on the 1st of October. Tehran said the missiles launched at Israel were in response to deadly Israeli attacks in Gaza and Lebanon. The Iranian Foreign Minister Abbas Arachi arrived in Egypt on Wednesday, the first such visit in years, as part of a wider Middle Eastern tour aimed at easing tensions. He held talks on Thursday with both his Egyptian counterpart and President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, who reiterated Cairo's call to avoid an expansion of the conflict. Sisi said an expanded war would have serious repercussions for the security and capabilities of all nations in the region. The Egyptian president reiterated calls to end Israel's war in Gaza and the escalation in Lebanon. He also called for Israel to stop violations in the West Bank and to ensure the delivery of much-needed humanitarian aid to Palestinians. At the end of a high-stakes summit in Brussels, European Union leaders signalled a potentially transformative shift in how the bloc approaches migration policy. EU leaders wrapped up a long summit in Brussels agreeing to outsource asylum returns policy to third countries outside the European Union. The controversial proposals represent a major, tougher shift in EU migration policy. In particular, EU countries want to focus on the deportations of asylum seekers whose claims have been denied. Leaders also discussed potential responses to hybrid attacks from outside actors in Russia and Belarus, which have sent innocent migrants to the borders of Finland and more recently Poland in a plan to destabilize the countries. Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk suspended the right to asylum, a cornerstone policy of international refugee law, in response to the Belarusian attack. What's clear is this is a whole new world for asylum policy and the European Union. What's not clear is how these return hubs will actually work. In particular, what happens to those asylum seekers who have had their claims denied when they're sent to third countries? And can their basic rights under international law be guaranteed? Moving to Australia now. Three hooded men remain on the run in Sydney's west after allegedly shooting a man in Homebush multiple times before setting a getaway vehicle alight. A Land Rover up in flames at Lidcombe, <laughs> forcing Daly Street residents from their homes. The force of the blaze broke a window before the fire was put out. <laughs> Police say this is the getaway car used in a targeted shooting just three kilometres away at Sydney Olympic Park. Residents at an apartment block on Fig Tree Drive say they heard gunshots ring out just before three this morning. A 29-year-old man suffered gunshot wounds to his arms. Alert and upright, he was treated in the back of an ambulance before he was taken to hospital in a serious but stable condition. 
Well, let's go in for a short commercial break. No global updates coming right after this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. South Korean author and Nobel Prize winner in literature, Hang Kang, made her first public appearance after staying out of the spotlight for a week. On Thursday, South Korean author Han Gang, the country's first Nobel Prize in literature, attended the 18th Pony Jong Innovation Award ceremony for her first public appearance since the Nobel Prize announcement. The past week, so many people celebrated as if it were their own achievement. I will remember that as a deeply touching experience. Since I connect with the world through my writing, I want to keep writing and meeting readers, just as I have done so far. After the Nobel Prize announcement, Han declined all press conferences and interviews except for a short interview with the Swedish media outlet SVT. She made her first appearance to receive the Pony Chong Innovation Award. That award was established in 2006 and is given to individuals or groups who bring positive change to Korean society through innovative thinking. The Pony Jung Foundation had already chosen Han as the winner of September 19th, and it was known that she had planned to attend even before the Nobel Prize announcement. The foundation explained that she was selected for her deep exploration of the human soul and her powerful ability to evoke emotions that captivate readers worldwide. Previous winners of the award include Hwang Dong-hyo, director of the Netflix series Squid Game, Cho Sung-jin, the first Korean to win the Chopin competition in 2015, and former UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon. Han Gang also mentioned that this year marks her 30th year of writing, and she's currently working hard to finish a novel she started earlier this year, aiming to complete it by the first half of next year. She added that in the next six years before she turns 60, she hopes to complete three more books. And moving on to our final story tonight. Excitement filled Manhattan's Javis Center as this year's New York Comic Con opened its doors to cosplayers from around the world. Excitement filled Manhattan's Javis Center on Thursday as this year's New York Comic Con opened its doors to cosplayers from around the world. With hundreds of thousands expected to attend the four day event, it was already filled with attendees cosplaying as their favorite characters from comic books, movies, and TV shows. The event's director, Christina Rogers, called the 2024 edition the first true full event back from the pandemic, adding that this year had improved accessibility, including the free live stream of several top panel sessions. Well, with that, we wrap up our final building for this week of World News, and we'll see you again on Monday with more great updates around the world. Well, stay tuned as Anuradhi Vikram Singh is joining you next with the Night Review Festival. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.